Now we are here with the estimates of uh, Mariana up to 2026. But from here, we need to reach uh, $50. And with these estimates, we are at $3. So we have uh, <laughs> still $47 oh. to go. Thir 37 would be enough. Or 35, actually. Okay, I'll uh, go for 42. I'll go. So. Oh, you lowered it? You're scared? Yeah, no, nah. <laughs> no okay, yeah, I'm not scared. Let's look. <laughs> 45 or 35, let's see. Like, okay. if, if it's below 40, I win. If it's above 40, you win, basically. Okay, 35. <laughs> okay, 39. No! <laughs> ah! Okay, like uh, AT&T um, hired consultants to try to estimate uh, the market size of the cell phones, and they completely leave up. Here, oh, yeah, she yeah. believes uh, that the market is completely underestimating uh, the AI size, of the, so the size of the AI market. And uh, the ontology is uh, that key enabler to deploying AI and machine learning. That's something that we've been uh, discussing for I don't know how many times uh, at uh, Palantir Weekly, but I believe uh, the financial community, so the clients uh, Mariana speaks with, uh, are still starting digesting or even just starting eating this concept of uh, oh you need an ontology to do something with ai i think that is still very obscure and uh, we are at least uh, six uh, months ahead in terms of understanding compared with uh, wall street and uh, there's a nice sentence that actually got me intrigued Panther seeks to capture a percentage of the value add it generates yeah this related to why the culture of the company matters more than just trying to monetize in the short term. Because uh, Palantir, rather than having like the classical uh, sales force that just uh, puts on steroids, uh, sales uh, with a thin product, uh, Palantir literally builds product uh, by the side of uh, customers uh, and uh, they try to develop a product that is so good that the sales uh, are there, but they are very marginal compared with uh, the engineering culture. But the fact that uh, Palantir seeks uh, to gradually capture this percentage of value added is like the premise that uh, we, we all bet around. Because uh, yeah. if Palantir is able to capture, to generate like uh, let's say you $1 billion value for a client, yep. the potential value that Palantir can actually extract as margin can be at in the 20, 30% of that value generated. Like if you're a client and a software gives you $1 billion advantage, you're just stupid not to pay <laughs> at least 20, yeah, 30% no. of that. Exactly that is what we've been speculating for a long time when we talk about like longer term monetization for Palantir and Carp has said it like multiple times. I think it was, was it like AIPCon 3? I'm not sure where, but uh, he basically made it clear that, uh, yeah, we're going to show you the value and you're going to pay us a lot of money. And it's all about the return on investment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what Mariana understands. Like, you can charge, like, uh, theoretically, you could charge uh, 500 million per year if you generate, like, 1 billion for the, for the client. Like, it, it's really endless. And uh, that's quite, an, that's what makes Palantir such an interesting uh, prospect, like, when you try to look at the business, because no one really does that. Like, we know for software as a service, there's, like, um, different models where you can offer a price per seat, for example, uh, or like a fixed cost per year. But this really like unlocks a lot of different things. Uh, uh, we are both uh, very grounded with uh, value investing uh, principles. And a couple of uh, years, uh, a couple of days ago, I just saw this uh, quote from, I don't remember if it was uh, Charlie Munger, Buffett, but it was a uh, top value investor underscoring uh, what you really, really crave uh, is a business that has uh, so much pricing power that potentially can rise uh, revenues every year that little bit just to keep capturing uh, the value it generates. And what's funny about uh, all these value investing quotes is that uh, everybody speaks, oh, a wonderful business. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. And then when they face a wonderful business like Palantir, oh, no, 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 that's too expensive. <laughs> 
the idea when you make a, a reverse DCF is not uh, to start from your input, uh, but and then obtain evaluation is uh, the yeah. other way around. You start yeah. from the evaluation, and in this case, uh, we want to test uh, the the fifty dollar uh, evaluation, and uh, you try to have uh, like a range of uh, inputs that could make sense to justify the valuation. In this case, uh, what we really want to do is not making a proper valuation, but is okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's test how strong uh, the assumptions. Mariana put in the numbers are to justify this price. Because if we see that uh, in order to reach $50 per share, Palantir needs to grow too much compared with uh, what oh. we think is reasonable to expect, I, then I uh, we it. could have a problem. Uh, exactly. 32.5% compounded for 10 years at 30% free cash flow margin is exactly $50. Uh, yep. So now we are here with the estimates of uh, Mariana up to 2026. But from here, we need to reach uh, $50. And with these estimates, we are at $3. So we have uh, <laughs> still $47 oh. to go. Uh, yeah, we are very far away with 30-30. The golden ah. ratio we used before. And uh, lo wait a second, look, uh, like what's uh, what's happening here? Like we see that by using a 30% growth uh, for the residual years, 30% free cash flow for the residual years, that uh, is already very not enough to reach 50. Yeah. Actually, we got it's to like, the price as of today. We are here. Yeah, yeah, we, we are there today. <laughs> Which means uh, that from uh, Mariana's numbers, to get to 50, we should mm. need to see something like a 40% growth. Tell me if I'm wrong. Oh, no, no, that's no, going to no, no, overshoot no. for sure. But that's going to be way above. Cancel what you are writing, but 50. go on 2027. Yeah. And uh, from here, gradually increase the progression of the revenue growth uh, up to 40. Because that, uh, up until we get. Uh, oh, gradually. Yeah. Like just uh, 30, uh, 36, it's something like that. Okay, 38, 39, 40, and then we're at 48. So okay. we need uh, to ramp higher here, like uh, 32. So you see, what we see already from here is that uh, if uh, we assume a uh, 30 percent free cash flow. After taxes, we need to have uh, 2027 onwards to grow more or less 35% uh, CAGR to justify more. Mariana's price. It's exactly like 37.1, some 37.05, 37.03. 37.02. No, no. <laughs> okay, we're satisfied. 37. Or, we're missing uh, 0.06 uh, of a dollar. Or if uh, we keep, uh, let's put 30% uh, uh, yeah. um, for the right. many years. In, you see that uh, we get to our case uh, as, of, uh, oh, as of before. In order to get to $50 by keeping 30% revenue growth after the estimates uh, Mariana provided, we think, uh, I think we need to go at 45 uh, free cash flow margin to reach uh, 50. What's your guess? Like, tell me a number <laughs> and let's see who has a better intuition. Uh, no, I, th I think it's lower. 40, you said 45? Yeah, I think you need the 45 to reach no. 50 from here. No, I think uh, 37 will be enough. Or 35, actually. OK, uh, I'll go for 42. Alone, so. Oh, you lowered it? You're scared? Yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> no, OK, yeah, I'm not scared. Let's look. <laughs> 45 or 35, let's see. Like, okay. if, if it's below 40, I win. If it's above 40, you win, basically. Okay, 35. 
Okay, 39. No. <laughs> ah! uh, your, your, your mental math is better. Uh, it's something like 42, 43, yeah. 42, basically. Like, that's uh, very high expectations, Mariana, I have to say. And like, this even is after taxes. Even... Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, 35 in 2026. Like, this is... I, I have a hard time understanding how or where, is, where this is going to come from. Uh, this close. Look, uh, when you come out with a price... Uh regardless of how you achieve it, now she says, okay, this is worth $50. Essentially, you need to have a story that makes sense to back the numbers to achieve $50. And if you, if uh, like uh, the problem I'm having with this $50 stuff is, is fine until you justify the path to get there. And the valuation she did, was uh, okay let's slap a multiple on uh, ev to growth so ev sales to growth and boom obviously in 2026 because this way you have a higher number compared with uh, using uh, the 2025 if she wanted <laughs> to have a, a higher even higher she would have used the same multiple on 2027 yeah, but uh, it's the same that all the analysts do, including Dan Ives. They don't need to justify it actually happening. Like, they just need to guess what the market will do. It seems like on Wall Street is all about uh, grabbing attention. When I saw this report of Mariana that uh, already had uh, a price target of uh, 30, if I remember correctly, she upgraded from 28 that had in the previous month, then in August increased to, to 30, and now she went from 30 to 50. I, like my, my, my feeling is uh, now the stock that she has been covering uh, well, where I think she's uh, the, the, the one that uh, understands best, best both uh, the qualitative aspects and the numerical aspects and the, go the, the government side, like she has the complete overview of the company. Essentially, she's now the star analyst uh, along uh, Dan Ives. So she has a golden opportunity in terms of career right now, because uh, the sell side analyst job uh, is not to make an investment, but to sell recommendations, to sell meetings to clients, to discuss with clients. So so in summary, you think th this is her opportunity to make her career, like make her name in the industry as the one who got Palantir right from the start. Like this is her one, like this is her big chance. I think uh, she has the chances right now to become like a Tony Sacconaggi for uh, Tesla. Uh, for uh, Apple, you have uh, that guy, Gene uh, Monstier, something like that, uh, from Deep, Deep Water Asset Management. Uh, so for each stock, uh, there are one, two analysts that uh, they tend to become like the voice of uh, truth, like the analyst that uh, are the Gordon, relevant Gordon ones. Johnson? Well, that's the anti-analyst. So I think uh, Rishi... <laughs> like so, Rishi is the Gordon. Like, uh, personally, I don't think... Uh, like, look, uh, there are two choices. Or, or Rishi is stupid as fuck, or uh, Rishi is playing a game. I don't think he's that dumb. I hope for him. But that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. but assuming that he's at least uh, a bit rational player, because in order to get into investment banking is actually tough. Essentially, an analyst opinion is worth uh, if it is peculiar. And uh, once uh, you have uh, some analysts that converge to a certain price, you have two choices if you want uh, to stand out. And the goal of our sell side analyst is to stand out, not to be in the consensus. Why? Because uh, as a sell side analyst, you make money to the firm if uh, clients call you because they want to call to hear your opinion. So imagine all the analysts converge to Palantir is worth thirty dollars right now. Okay, you are a fund manager, and you are considering opening a position on Palantir. Who do you call? You try to call the two guys that seem the pros on the stock and you try to, so maybe they are the most uh, bullish and uh, you also try to call the ones that look the most uh, 
bearish. And you try to triangulate the information in a way that, okay, this is uh, the feeling, the picture I have. Okay. So I guess Rishi at this point, uh, unless it is uh, dumb as fuck, he's playing the game of I become the Gordon Johnson because uh, like it or not, uh, Gordon Johnson is a, is a character. Like people know him and uh, the firms make money with his name. He's and a brand. there's also, yeah, exactly. And uh, Mariana right now has the opportunity to stand out as uh, the most important uh, bullish analyst uh, along the knives. And uh, for instance, if uh, she increased uh, the price of from 30 to 32, it would have been like, okay, like that's a regular puff. But if out of nowhere, like now she slaps a boom, 50. So she was already quite optimist. And now she slaps a 50 price, uh, price. That's like from 50 to, sorry, from 30 to 50. That's already 66% variation compared with yeah. one month ago. Compared with like two months ago. Yeah, that's like the double. what did you find out in one month uh, <laughs> to make this? Because uh, uh, the event she was at, um, the recent AIP con that you also attended and you got the chance to even talk to her. Like that's like a month and a half ago, two months ago. It's not, it's not that, that long ago. Like what did you find out since then? Uh, but there's also this dynamic. Uh, when we're talking sell-side analysts, it's not, as you mentioned, it's not only about her and her making a name. It's also about the, the firm and the incentives the firm have. So I made this a while ago. Uh, Sachin Watts posted some tip ranks. And I looked because back in 2023, this is like over a year ago now, when the stock was in the absolute dumps, uh, there was a narrative that Palantir was being compared to Snowflake and Datadog. That's not so much the case today anymore. Uh, I think Palantir clearly differentiated itself from those two companies. But at the time, they were. So if we look here at uh, the distribution, like if we take all the Palantir analysts and then we find that many of them also cover Snowflake and Datadog. And analysts who do cover uh, more than Palantir always have a sell or a hold for Palantir while they have a buy or a hold for Snowflake or Datadog. So if we look at uh, William Blair here, I don't, is he still the analyst for William Blair? I'm not sure. Uh, a sell for Palantir buy snowflake buy datadog and at the time snowflake was trading like at insane valuations like i it was like 180 and when i valued it i got it to like 50 so it's, it was like something completely insane that we talked about back then uh, but here also uh, deutsche bank sell palantir buy snowflake uh keith weiss uh i think he's actually quite respected in his own regard i've seen him on cnbc multiple times talking tech companies like I think he is sort of a renowned name. Hold Palantir by Snowflake. And you see this like Tyler from Citigroup, also a um, long-term bear. <laughs> he recently turned to like hold, I think, with his 28 target. But back then, sell, but buy Snowflake. And this was always the case. Like whenever we got the revisions, if they have a hold or sell on Palantir, they would have a buy on Snowflake and Datadog. So it was a really interesting dynamic. And it's clear that there was some sort of agenda against Palantir that went the DPO route rather than uh, pay uh, uh, these banks a lot of money to uh, go through the IPO process. So but in our private chat, like I get a picture of a new lake every day, new hike trip, like he's very active. And uh, props to Arnie. Can you show your guns? For the for the stream, my first stream. Okay. Look at that boy. <laughs> like, chill, 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 chill. My, my wife is on this app, man. Chill. Leave, <laughs> leave, leave some women for the rest of us. <laughs> Relax. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. See you next time. <laughs> Thanks, the comment. Feel the pump. <laughs>